Hey there, everyone. This is uh, Tom with Tom's Talk Show, and today we're going to be covering uh, something that was like a real pet peeve of mine, and I just, I guess I just have to get over it. I wrote it all down so that it would just kind of get out of my system. Uh, too many churches that we've gone to over the years did not, just don't seem to give enough uh, emphasis and detail in communion and what it does, and what it is, and why, and, and all of these things. So, I wrote a paper about it, and that's what we're going to read and kind of go through here. So, okay, let's just jump in and we'll start. Okay, so this is, it's called At the Communion Table is what I wrote. Um, so, so for many years, I've had a problem with churches just giving a small three-minute part of their service to communion. Uh, we need to understand the background of what each part really means. God does not do things in a small scale. Right? Our DNA is so complex that science has just scratched the surface. How much more is there in the ceremony of communion, recognizing that the event points directly to the basis of our salvation? Okay, we can start by reading uh, with Matthew, one of the first mentions, uh, instituting communion in Matthew 26, 26 and 29. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread. After a blessing, he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. When he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit or the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay, this brings together references to bread and wine from across the scriptures, right? Moving back to the beginning, we see references to communion in Genesis. So 14, 17, Melchizedek brought out bread and wine to bless Abraham. But we know the breaking of bread and the cup is not just a New Testament event. They did this all over the place. But the new part was that Christ was saying, this is my body that's going to be broken for you and my blood that is going to be built for you. That's the big difference when, when Christ is at weakness. Okay, we have references here in the book, first book in the New Testament uh, of the Old. So we have reference in the first book of the New Testament and the first book of the Old Testament. Ooh, we can break down the word communion. So they didn't even use the word communion back there. So communion is Old French, uh, 12th century meaning community. Communion 15th century, meaning that which is common to all, and communionium, which means fellowship, mutual participation, and sharing. The word communion was not used in the Bible. Not until centuries later, early notes found that it was called a common meal of the early church. Other notes call it the agape, or love feast. So this is a celebration of Romans 5.8. God demonstrated it his own love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what they were, they were celebrating. I mean, the early church would they'd like go sell everything, go give everything to the community, share everything in the community, and, and you know, further do outreach. So one of the big questions I always think is like when. So it, some churches do, you know, first of the month, last of the month, every other month, you know. Okay, when and where should we partake? Just to get this out of the way, because there are so many deeper parts of communion. So when and how often should we participate? Well, the Bible's not very clear. Acts 2, 46, as we are told, that the early Christians were breaking bread from house to house and taking their meals together, would give us the impression that uh, they were having communion almost daily. Right? These were truly on-fire Christians at the time. They were being killed for their families, and their family sent to slavery just for acknowledging Jesus. I mean, we have the... You've heard, you know, um, on 4th of July holidays, the Roman candle. Roman candle, of course, is when the Romans would stick a... put a Christian on a corner post, a corner of a street, and light them on fire to help light the street. So that's what they were, were dealing with. Okay, so... We also see in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, that Paul instructed the Corinthian church 
as often as you drink it. The word often does not refer uh, reference to any time of day or frequency, although it would imply they were partaking on a regular basis. These verses give us some insight into where we should partake. The, they were meeting in each other's homes when they gathered to worship. So, as seen in the definition of the word origins of communion, it was customary to, take, to partake whenever they assembled. They got together in whoever's house. I mean, it would, it would be normal just for people to sit down and take communion and then eat. Yeah. Not in a church, not you know, anything else. So. so here we go. We can have communion at church, at Bible studies, at home meetings, with your family, or just by yourself. Whenever and often as you want. The key is to have a full understanding of what communion means and how it is a center point of our faith. Okay. So the next part is, is the table. So back in the Old Testament, we have a description of the table of showbread. This was an ornate table. Of worship that in Exodus 25 30 we are to set the bread before God at all times this table was adorned with gold and was carried just as the Ark of the Covenant was carried they were carried together with poles that slid into rings attached to the side of the table a table to meet God was an extreme reverence and importance so already we're seeing that this is very important this is not something that Okay, we've got 30 seconds at the end of service, so let's everybody hand this out. No. The meal table in the Jewish community was of high importance. Who they ate with was particularly important. It was a sign of acceptance. When Christ would eat with an outcast, an unpopular, lowly, and sinners, it was a way to show that he was accepting of everyone. Which is one of the reasons that, you know, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and things of the time we're like, what is he doing? Why he, if he's supposed to be some... He was in the temple reading from the Bible, reading from, you know, the scriptures. And now, you know, he's in there with those people, right? So in Matthew 9, 11 through 13, Jesus is asked by the Pharisees about why he's eating with the tax collectors and sinners, which he basically replied, replied the healthy do not need a healer. So Jesus also sought out the poor blind crippled to dine with. We see his teaching about this in Luke 14, 16 through 24, in the parable of the dinner. Here the elite, a landowner, a farm owner, newly married, would not come to the table. They were easily distracted by things of the world, but the others were willing to come and even uh, passers by on the highway. We need, not, we need to not be too busy right, to meet God at, at his table. Very important. So what are the requirements for coming to the table? This is a very uh, kind of uh, different subject or a subject that's, that's of you know, discussion, controversy, um, is what are the requirements? I've heard for years in churches that you need to be saved, you have to have all your sins confessed, settle up with all the people that are around you, you know, that you had did wrong uh, before taking communion. And I think if we were to try and do that, no one would ever take communion because you would be too busy trying to figure out who you did something wrong to. Now, is it good to go back to people and say, you know, I did this and I think it hurt you and apologize? 100%. You absolutely should do that. But does that keep you from communion? No, you can bring it up and lay it before God right there at communion and then go later, even though in the Bible it says just go right then uh, but it's a, it was a different situation, I think, at the time. Okay, in the upper room, the disciples did not have the power of the Holy Spirit and at most times could not understand the messages that Jesus was speaking about. Whenever he did the parables, he always had to go back and tell the disciples what they meant. All right, when Jesus was being taken to the cross, they went back to their old ways of life. In John 21, we see Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, James, John, all went back to fishing. Right, so did that mean that their time at communion table with, with Christ was meaningless? No, of course it wasn't. To say that we need to be full on fire, sinless Christian to have communion is definitely not true. So let's look at uh, Luke nineteen five through 7. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, Zacchaeus, 
Hurry, come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He's gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to that house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to to seek and to save that which was lost. So a man so here he is someone coming to uh basically a table, coming to his dinner table, and his life was changed. But was he a Christian before? No. But it's your attitude of your heart where you are. I mean if you are seeking God, right, then absolutely go, you know, go to communion. What better place to meet God. So here Jesus went to the tax collector, a known to be cruel and cheat people all the time. Jesus goes to his house, and this changes Zacchaeus' life. So in this example, dining with Jesus radically changed someone's life. Again in Luke 14.1, it happened that when he went into the house and one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. Here Jesus talks about a parable of guests where they should place themselves last and be invited forward. And that they should be invited, they should invite people to meals who cannot repay them so that they will be blessed. Some simply, simple ways to live a godly life. And at the end of the meal, one of the Pharisees said, Luke 14, 15b said, Blessed of everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Surely something was stirring in that man's heart by breaking bread at the table of Christ. Moving to Luke 7, 36-50, we see Jesus at the table of a Pharisee. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Of course, right then they just had, you know, low tables and basically pillows to recline against, right? That's how things worked back then. Not like regular dining tables and chairs like we use today. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. This woman proceeded to weep, kiss, and pour the perfume on Jesus' feet. Really, she knew who Christ was and was repentant. This is why, after telling of the parable, the two debtors, the verse it states in verse 50, and he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The woman knew of her sin and was desperate for forgiveness. It is any coincidence that Christ was at a table when this happened. When we come to the table, we are meeting Jesus and should be as, and should be as this woman, repentant, and she brought the most valuable thing that she had, the perfume. Okay, so we read this over. Oh, you just got to, you know... You went to Walmart and bought a perfume out of the cabinet. And that's kind of what we see as perfume, but no, not, not back then. This bottle would have cost up to an entire year's worth of wages. Typically, when a woman was of age, the family would purchase the alabaster vial, which would then hold the ointment or perfume. It was then sealed so that it would not dry out. The seal would then be broken and the perfume poured over the future bridegroom of the woman. This is such an appropriate action, right? So we as the church are the bride and Jesus is the bridegroom. And she took that vial that was going to be used, you know, for her wedding. She sacrificed that, you know, for, for Christ. Right? The table is also a place of recognition. As Jesus rose from the grave and met with some travelers on the road to Emmaus, this is described, of course, in Luke 24, 13, and 35. The story is that Jesus was walking with two men and talking with them about what had happened to Jesus. They stopped and eventually sat at a table together to eat. Here's where Jesus breaks bread with them. In Luke 24, 35b, it states, he was recognized by the breaking of bread. So in doing that, you know, basically starting of communion is where he was recognized. I think that this event is therefore to encourage others to come to the table, no matter what their current relationship to God, because it is there that they can recognize and meet God. Very, very important.
Okay, next thing in communion, of course, is the bread. Jesus took the bread and broke it. So let's look at that. We have already seen in Exodus 25, the table was described as a place where the bread was covered in gold, made the table that was described to just place the bread on it, right? It was covered in gold and made to carry with them just like the ark. Symbolism and importance is just evident throughout the Bible. Exodus 12, we have the instruction on the Feast of Bread. So, Exodus 12, 15, Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove the leaven from your houses. This was given when, uh, just after Passover, when the Israelites had placed blood on their doorposts as in a symbol of the cross. Naturally, the pairing of bread is also significant. So, why unleavened bread? Biblically, leaven is symbolic of, of sin. It kind of gets, you put a little leaven in there, it just gets into everything, right? As a human, we can really remove, can we really remove all the leaven in our homes? Uh, we all have bread, whether gluten-free or not. The yeast is needed to make it rise. And it only takes a small amount of leaven and an entire bowl of batter. The Old Testament times was quite difficult. They did not have, you know, like marble smooth countertops or, that clean cooking area, if they even had a kitchen at all. Most of it was probably made of wood or maybe some stone. Uh, and for one week, they cannot eat anything with leaven. In Exodus 13, 5, we see unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days. This would ensure that the old bread would not be brought into the new bread. We were leaving, they were leaving behind their old lives, habits, habits and sins to start a new life. So this is a very a huge example of repentance. So you're taking all the things that you had before, taking them and throwing them away, starting out clean and starting a new life in, in Christ as, as it were. Okay, Jesus also, ref Jesus also referred to the bread and leaven as false teaching in Matthew 16. Verse 6 says, watch out and beware of leaven of Pharisees and Sadducees. And we see this uh, even when we get into, uh, like Paul's writing Corinthians, they had uh, different people who were bringing up different philosophies and different uh, theologies and trying to lean people to them. Some were of Paul, some were of Apollo, some were of this person or that person. And they were trying to say, maybe the resurrection didn't happen, all these other things. And then it would spread to many people. So just similar, similar things. So the disciples were confused by this at first. And then Christ explained to them that in verse 12, they understood it was talking about bad teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now again, here in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 and 7, your boasting is not good. Do you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And... Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover also has been sacrificed. Yes, I, I, I always thought maybe I should get a t-shirt that says, I'm a new lump. So clearly leaven is, in the bread, is, is a symbol of sin. And that Christ was sacrificed to cover our sin, and Jesus is symbolic of bread. So, wait, okay, let's... Continue to Jesus' birth. When we find the story in Luke 2, a decree went out for a census. Of course, what does that mean? Uh, right now, I mean, today's day when we have, you know, like the census every 10 years, you know, you just probably fill out a little form, send it in, you know, kind of a done deal. Well, they didn't really have that back then. So now each family was required to go to the city of their heritage. Joseph was a descendant of the house of David that required them to travel from Nazareth to the city of David, Bethlehem. This is a trip of 90 miles. Now, Joseph had to take a then very pregnant Mary over this terrain. He had to be, there had to be a reason that God manipulated the Roman Empire to have another census. They could call them at any time. Uh, Bethlehem means the house of bread. Uh, how appropriate, Christ, who said in John 6, 34, I am the bread of life to be born in a city that is the house of bread. And how appropriate that is that Jesus was laid in a manger, a place of food. And this is also a fulfillment of prophecy in Micah 5.2. It says, but as for you, 
Bethlehem Ephrath, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth for me to be ruler of Israel. Back in the Old Testament, uh, we see, and we see God using bread as a symbol. When the Israelites left Egypt and began moving across the wilderness, God sent bread from heaven every day as manna, right? And double portions on the sixth day so they could rest and worship on the seventh day. This is detailed in Exodus 16, 4 and 5. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, it will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather it a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. On the sixth day, they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. How often should we be getting our daily bread from God? Well, each day, of course. That's why, you know, the, the in Luke 11.3, it says, give us each day our daily bread, not take care of the rest of our lives with millions of dollars, right? And continues in verse 4, and forgive us our sins. The pairing between the bread and the blood is even there in the Lord's Prayer. As we take care, take in the bread of Christ, we remember that his blood paid for our sins. So if that was not enough, let us move to the Yachatz, part of the Passover cedar. Here, is, here we see Jewish culture demonstrating the existence of Jesus. In this ritual, three pizzas of matzah bread are placed in a white bag. They do not even, today, they don't even recognize how this is depicting the Trinity. Three pieces in one bag. So clear, but we go further. In this ceremony, the middle piece is removed and broken, just as Christ was broken on the cross. Now they take the larger part of the bread and wrap it in the cloth and hide it somewhere in the house. This is a double meaning. Symbolism, one for Israel, that God was silent for 400 years between the Old Testament and the birth of Jesus. Unfortunately, they missed Jesus' birth and teaching. The second is a realization is that Christ was here and has gone away and that he comes again will be a greater event, hence the larger piece of the bread being hidden away. Finally, let's go to John 6.35. Here Jesus just lays it out for the people. He said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. He's plainly stating that he is what we need to live, what we need to sustain our physical and spiritual lives. Just as he said in the Lord's Prayer, give us each day our daily bread. The word used in both places is artos, which is Greek for bread, loaf, or meal. This is clear that we need to ingest Christ every day. A quick last set of verses to seal this one off. Let's go to John 6, 48 through 51, where it states, Your father ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I also give for the life of the world is my flesh. Clearly, Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. You brought together the representation laid out throughout Scripture. Now we move on to the wine section. So this is the ultimate symbol for Christ dying on the cross, shedding his blood for our sins. But Christ did not shed blood once on his way to the cross, but four times. Now let's look at the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke 22, 43-44. states that Jesus sweat drops of blood. Under heavy stress, a person can break blood vessels in the skin and sweat blood. This is a condition known as hematohydritis, hydrosis. There have been a few studies done on this, but it's a condition where the body is under such stress that Okay, we're moving on to the wine now. So uh, this is the ultimate symbol for Christ dying on the cross, shedding his blood for our sins. But Christ did not shed blood once on his way to the cross, but four times. Let's look at the Garden of Gethsemane at Luke 22, 43, 44. It states that Jesus sweat drops of blood. Under heavy stress, a person can 
uh, break blood vessels in their skin. Wet blood is a condition known as hematohydrosis. There have been a few studies on this, but it is a condition where the body is under such stress that the blood vessels near the skin burst and mix with sweat to pour down your face. Christ, knowing the task ahead of him, with taking all the sins of everyone in the world, past, present, and future, would be more stress than his human body could handle. Good thing he was also God at the same time. Next, we have Jesus at the whipping post. This is written in John 19, Mark 15, and Matthew 27. The pilot ordered Christ to be flogged. A typical flogging in Roman times was brutal, often preceded crucifixion. The whip that was used was considered of many, not one, long straps. These straps were embedded or attached rocks, metal, or any sharp object. This basically cat of nine tails was then lashed out, wrapped around the victim's body, embedded the shards into the skin. The soldier would then give a yank to set the whip into the skin and finally pull and rip the skin off of the person. This would tear flesh from the body and then enough times would get down even to tearing the muscles and exposing bones <clears throat> underneath. Which is no surprise why Christ had to be helped carrying his cross as seen as Matthew 27 where Simon was asked to Thirdly, Jesus is crowned with a crown of thorns that the Roman soldiers pushed the thorns deep into the scalp, making him bleed. The plant is a Euphoria mili, also called the Christ thorn. The common name refers to the thorny crown Jesus was forced to wear during his crucifixion. The plant has blood-red flowers. Again, God's detail is astounding. This is accounted for in Mark 15 and John 19. The thorns of this plant can be over one inch in length, and this when this was placed in Christ's head, surely would have penetrated deep into his skull. Thinking about the crown being called King of the Jews, I contrast that with kings and, and conquest and military. Conquest, a common soldier, would be the one who sheds the blood for the king, where Christ himself shed the blood as lordship was recognized, even if it meant mocking way by the Romans. Finally, Christ was stabbed with a sword on the cross. Here we see in John 19, the soldiers shoved a spear into Jesus' side and blood and water came out. So we can determine that the spear went in through his ribcage and then pierced his heart. Medical autopsies have shown that people who die of severe heart stress often cause a buildup of pericardial fluid around the heart. So it makes sense that he would see both come out from the cut made by the sword. So what's the significance? Uh, this is a fulfillment of prophecy of Zechariah 12. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace, of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like weeping bitterly over a firstborn. These verse, the verse points directly to Christ being stabbed and not having his legs broken, as was typically done during those being crucified, were taking too long to die. Also, Old Testament references Exodus 12, Numbers 9, Psalm 34, that during the Passover meal, none of the animal's bones will be broken. Pointing it again to Jesus' bones, not none of Jesus' bones being broken on the cross. We can also discuss the two separate fluids that came out. This can point to baptism and being identified with the blood washing, just as the water in the baptismal flows over us, and that Jesus died of a broken heart for us. Since we are at the cross, let's move back to the beginning where the Israelites experienced the Passover, here in Exodus 12, where God told Moses and Aaron that, moreover, they shall take some blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house in which they eat. It's no accident here that uh, this forms the tips of a cross that Jesus would one day hang on, even though they had not even been developed or thought of yet. Okay, later in Exodus chapter 24, we see Moses and Israel were making peace offering to God. In verse 8, we see Moses taking the blood and sprinkling it over the people as a covenant that God had made with them. So, when in the upper room, Christ says to Matthew 26, 28, For this is my blood of the covenant, the disciples should have immediately connected the words and the meaning. Jumping into Deuteronomy 12, the instruction was that any animal that was consumed, that the blood was to be poured out. 
This verse reads, Only you shall eat, only you shall not eat the blood. You are to pour it out on the ground like water. This is significant that the sacrifice would require blood and that one day Christ's blood would be poured out for us. At, and notice it is to be poured out like water. We just saw earlier that when Christ was pierced, blood and water came out. There are, so, there are more references to blood and sacrifice in the Old Testament. Go to Second Chronicles 29 where Hezekiah restores worship at the temple in verse 22. Says, so they slaughtered the bulls and the priests took the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. They also slaughtered the rams and sprinkled it on the altar. They slaughtered lambs and sprinkled it on the altar. This was done, as noted in verse 24, to atone for all Israel. We know that the latter that Christ would be this sacrifice for the entire world. In John, 1 John 2, 2 states, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for all the sins of the world. It's a huge statement here takes us back to the garden of garden and the blood and sweat. Jesus is taking all of the sins of the world. We are saved by his blood as shown in Romans 5, 9. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Here we are saved from the wrath of God because of Jesus. For me, I prefer to be on the safe side of the equation. The old temple where the priests had to take blood into the second inner chamber once a year is replaced by Christ through his blood, as noted in Hebrews 9. When, when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of his creation, of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. He created a new tabernacle with his own blood so that we can freely access salvation and communication with him. Another side note, uh, with Jesus' first miracle detailed for us in John 2, the wedding at Cana. We know the story that they ran out of wine at the wedding and Mary told Jesus to help, and he turns the water into wine. So this miracle at his was at a wedding, which is a symbol of Christ being the bridegroom of the church, being the bride. This miracle of the wine was key in the disciples to believe that he was the Savior. Okay, finally, here we're getting down to it. The covenant. Throughout all these verses, we see talk of a covenant. We see these in Old Testament passages, that the sacrifice was a covenant with God. The word used here is breath. The word, root of the word is to cut. So a covenant would be referred to as a cutting. This was done in those times as a serious agreement between two parties. In Jeremiah 34, 18, it says they cut a calf in half and passed between its two parts. This was a serious commitment. The two entering the covenant would take a perfect animal and kill it. Then the animal was cut in half, pulled apart, leaving the blood between the two halves. They would walk off on the blood between the two halves, as detailed in the remainder of the chapter in Jeremiah. Those who had not fulfilled the covenant were given into the hands of their enemies and that their bodies would be food for birds and animals. Yes, so God holds his covenants to the highest level. The Latin origin of the word covenant is con genere, which means coming together to create a contract. The original Hebrew is much more serious. Today we have contracts between two parties. These contracts are often exceptionally long, filled with extensive legal clauses to ensure each side is covered, and specific penalties can be assessed if one does break the contract. That is to say, contracts are based on distrust. A covenant is based on trust, that those entering the covenant are willing to kill an animal, walk between the two halves with the other party, and would rather die than break that covenant. So taking this and putting this word covenant in front of the disciples in the upper room where Jesus states in Matthew 26, 28, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many forgiveness of sins. And again in Mark 14, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. And in Luke 22, in the same way he took the cup after eating, saying this is this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. 
the disciples would recognize the word Berith and know the seriousness of what Christ was talking about. I love that Luke, Luke, he writes that this is a new covenant, that the old ways of the sacrifice were no longer needed, that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice covering our sins. Okay, my conclusion here is that through the study, I've scratched the surface. Take time yourself to come across references to bread, wine, and covenants in the Bible. God's perfect plan of bread and wine being the symbols of the body and blood of Christ, which fulfills prophecies written hundreds of years before, shows the omnipotence and omniscience of God. As we come to the table, we can see that lives are changed. When we partake of the bread, we understand this is Christ, the bread of life. The bread delivered in the wilderness from the city of bread. And that bread is unleavened or without sin, as Christ is without sin. Finally, the wine, perfect representation of Jesus' shed blood on the cross. To make that wine, the grapes must be hard-pressed, just as Christ took the pressure of all of our sins on himself. Hope that the words written here will, when we take communion, that we will see the depth, meaning, and history of what it means physically, culturally, spiritually, and how this points to Christ in the Old and New Testament. And that's the end of it, my little 13, 13 pages. Um, so I'll put a link to this if you want to share uh, it with anybody else. Um, I've had a couple of different pastors read it over it and gotten a couple of comments, you know, throughout the years. But um, it's kind of set how it was when I first wrote it. And I still kind of stick by it today. So um, hopefully you got something out of this as part of our thing that we're doing with the Glenn Beck 40 days. Um, and I thought this just kind of fit right in. So thanks for watching. If you have any comments or questions, you know, please feel free uh, to put those down below. And again, like, share, and subscribe to this channel as we continue to go through this. All right. Thanks for watching.